Hi everyone! Uh, ooh, my voice cracked. Uh, welcome back to Titanic Talkline. My name is Alexia. I am sorry for the delay, um, just because I'm an oversharer. I've been adjusting a medication that's been giving me migraines and brain fog like nobody's business. Like, I'm. It feels like there's constantly something in my eye. I can't quite see. It's just. It's super annoying. I'm finally slowly starting to feel better, but that's why everything's running, running really, really late. And um, yeah, I don't want to take up much more of your time. So please enjoy this interview. Awesome. Uh, well, I am really excited to have you because so <laughs> for the listeners, I don't subscribe to anyone on Patreon, except <laughs> for LA Beatles and the Unsinkable Titanic podcast. And I normally like guests inter introduce themselves, but I, I was too excited, so I introduced you. But please introduce yourself better. <laughs> oh, well, no, thank you. I, I, uh, that's really, it's so wonderful uh, to hear that. It means a lot. I was nervous <laughs> to start the, the Patreon back when I did. I, you know, it's, it is a nerve wracking experience to say like, Hey, if you, if you like the podcast, you know, maybe <laughs> actually like give me some of your hard earned money that right. you work for. Um, but it's, I've had such an amazing response on there and, and I really value every single person on there. So thank you for that. Um, I, you know, I, my name is Leslie Ann. I go by LA. I am a historian. I, I you know, a million years ago now, I went to grad school for American history. I have a PhD in American history from the University of Georgia. Uh, because people told me that, you know, Titanic really wasn't something you studied in academic uh, circles. It's something I sort of um, walked away from for a while in my adult life. Uh, and I've studied everything from environmental history to the history of industrialization. Um, I... I studied a lot in the period of, you know, 1880 to 1920. And so I have that really firm, you know, background on, on history of that period. But yeah, I, I did the PhD, did some teaching, that kind of thing, worked at a couple of museums as well. I took some time off to have my kids. Mm -hmm. And now that they're in school, I, this is kind of the way I've jumped back in the pool of, of being a historian and trying to be out there in the conversation is through the Titanic podcast. And I just decided last September to go for it. And I've had the best response. I've met so many amazing people like you and Aww. it's, really just been an incredible it's become this ride that i'm just on and it's not even all controlled by me it's you know i like i just i'm kind of you know for all the water metaphors just kind of like riding the current <laughs> and um what keeps happening is i just keep meeting you know authors and podcasters and just titanic people that make me think of new episode ideas every day so it's That's really awesome. exciting and it's exciting to be here on another podcast and <laughs> Yeah, I just am excited to see what you want to talk about. I think it's really interesting that you said that, you know, Titanic isn't something you study because it reminds me, I went to the University of Maryland and that's where Jim Henson went and he just created his own master, uh, not master, he created his own degree in puppeteering because he was like, well, this is what I've decided we're going to make a degree in, so get out of my mm -hmm. way, we're doing this. And Yeah, I, it, I appreciate I mean, that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. And, and I, if I could go back and redo, uh, you know, my, you know, gra oh. there he goes. I'm just going to talk over him. He's just going to have to okay. deal with it. I didn't know if you wanted to pause or anything. Um, no, I think it's, I think it's wonderful to conceptualize, especially like grad programs and, and higher education. That way I think people need to do more of that. If I don't regret anything, I learned so much, but if I could go back and redo my grad academic journey, um, there's definitely a lot of like, you know, interdisciplinary possibilities with Titanic, um, with naval history. And yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't know, maybe one day I could get back in the classroom with all this and do some more teaching. That would be fun. But um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, you know, thankful for my unique journey uh, that got me here. And now I'm just the Titanic girl. So there you go. Speaking of your journey, how, what was your, you, you mentioned, you know, walking away from Titanic for a little bit to, you know, live your life, which, you know, how dare you. But um, <laughs> before that happened, what was your journey to Titanic? Like, how did you find your way there? Um, Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet. Uh, so I was, <laughs> and you know, people have listened to my podcast. This may be repetitive to them, but I was 13 years old when 
the movie came out in 97. Mm -hmm. So I was the perfect demographic to just be knocked off my feet. And I, you know, fell in love with cinema, fell in love with Leo, fell in love with Kate. I went 13 times. Um, got to the point. Yeah. And my, my dad and mom wouldn't take me anymore. They just started <laughs> dropping me. They started dropping me off at the theater. And then I would have to use like a pay. This, tell, this tells everybody how old I am, obviously, but I would have to use a pay phone to call them to come pick me up. And so, uh, so I just, I fell in love with the movie and then fell in love with the ship because of it. And I think also kind of fell in love with like cinema because mm-hmm. of it. I really credit James Cameron for opening up my kind of becoming a cinephile a little bit, just becoming like a, a movie person, uh-huh. especially sort of an epic movie person. Right. Um, so yeah, it was the movie for me turned into the ship. And then throughout, you know, the last 20 years has 25 years has just been kind of a combination of loving both. And I think the cultural history of the movie is so intricately tied to the history of the ship now too, that it sort of all works together. So. I think you're right, especially because there have been certain historical discoveries that have like come out of the making of the film to validate mm-hmm. what happened. Because for me, I was a, a little younger than you were when the movie came out. I was eight. I don't remember. I can't do math. I was either eight or nine when it was in theaters. So I was a little younger, old enough, I think, to begin to appreciate sort of an epic film. And I appreciated that it was gorgeous. And I thought the music was beautiful. I, I was, I, I wasn't, I'm a violinist. So I liked, oh, wow. yeah, I liked all of that. And of course, you know, ooh, pretty dresses and, you know, pretty people. It was very, mm-hmm. I could understand all of that. But then it came to a bunch of themes that I had never seen, like bribery and suicide mm-hmm. where I was eight years old. Mm-hmm. I want, I think I've mentioned on the show before, it's like, I wanted to pause the theater and demand an explanation. It was like, somebody here needs to tell me what's going on. Cause mm-hmm. it was the first time I'd seen a quote unquote grown up movie that I was interested in. Yeah. I think it was that for a lot of people. And I've, I've shown parts of it to my kids mm-hmm. who are six and seven. And I, you know, I haven't shown them that the whole ending yet because I just don't know that they're it's quite ready for like the Murdoch suicide scene and that sort of thing mm-hmm. so they they think of Titanic as like you know King Leo on the bow and it's beautiful and they fell in love oh. and I'm the kind of I'm the kind of parent like I'll let them like I'll let them watch the sex scene I don't care about that like yeah. I you know like two My people mom was the same like way. Yeah, like two people loving on each other. Like what? I mean, that's fine. I just don't want them to like the violence is what I'm more worried about them getting in their head too young and wondering about things. But I think so too. I think even at 13, it was one of the first movies that was sort of epic and had things like a suicide that I felt like the movie, I could connect to the movie and it was relatable, but it also had some adult themes in it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of the beauty of what James Cameron did. And I don't know if you've talked about it yet on your podcast, but there's a um, a documentary on Disney Plus, I think is where it's streaming, called Titanic 20 Years Later. And he actually outlines uh, really well kind of some of the discoveries they've made from studying the wreck mm-hmm. since the movie, because yeah. James Cameron's been down 33 more times to the wreck <laughs> since he... I knew it was a lot. That... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so he's, you know, he's been, he's been down there a lot since. And so a lot of what they've uncovered and discovered since 97 has taught us uh, quite a bit more about the wreck, which is like some people who, some people who are like Titanic people, but they're like, screw James Cameron. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody can think whatever they want to think. That's obviously like a hundred percent my belief in life. But I will say, I think it's a little problematic because to completely dismiss James Cameron, you know, like he's done so much research and funded so much of the research Mm -hmm. uh, that it's sort of, I don't think you can ply apart those two things. Now I think at the very least, you kind of have to respect like how much money and time he's poured into continuing to study Titanic, even after the movie was long out of theaters, you know, so. I think James Cameron's a really good example of people that are just like enthusiasts to turn it into something else. Is your food here? Yeah. Yes. Let me, uh, hopefully that won't be too hard yeah. to edit. Uh, I don't think so. I'm going to go let the dog in because he's complaining I'm not even going to, I'm going to not even stop the oh. recording. I think that'll, I don't want to complicate Squadcast. So I'm just going to do that and come yeah, back go. and just let it run. I'll be back. Later. Come on. Come on. All right. Awesome. I almost murdered my cat. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was running up the stairs. 
stairs. <laughs> oh no! And she was underfoot. Anyway, let me take oh, a deep breath. I, now no, I'm please. out of breath because I was like, oh god, it's I almost killed the cat. cat. Dude, my... she's an old cat. Like stepping on her could end it all. Like it's not. It would not be pretty. My dog. I call him Lado Underfoot because he's just constantly underfoot. I'm like, how have you managed this? You're knee height, so he just manages to get there. <laughs> constantly kneeing him in the face, tripping over him. It is a thing. <laughs> Yeah, this cat is, I mean, I don't know. I, she's like, we call, we say she has like 20 lives. Uh, she's a creaky old cat. Anyway, okay. Katie. Here uh, we go. Awesome. Um, I do have a, um, a Cameron question going back to the, oh, to yeah. the film. Cause I, I am one of those bad Titanic fans that haven't seen most of the other movies mostly cause who has time, but, um, being that it's now been a little while since the movie came out, and I'm a huge fan of the Cameron film. I'm not one of those anti-Camerons. Is there anything that we know now, looking back on it, that you think, especially with like a re-release coming up, that if you could change or if we should change, that they should just go ahead and do it? <laughs> um do you think like, do you mean like something that could be easily edited out? Or do you mean like major changes that like if he could go back and redo the script kind of thing? Both. He has he has enough money where if he wanted to, he, he could f- figure that out, I'm sure. I mean, I think it would be really cool if he, you know, did some sort of re-release um, in that capacity. But, I, you know, my main complaints about the movie after being a super fan for 25 years, right. I think the things that, that, that really stick out to me are, um, you know, Margaret Brown is partially just wrong <laughs> in the movie. Um, that she's is fair. More, yeah. I mean, she's more right than other films have been. Um, you know, she was a very kind person. So she would have been someone who would have say helped a third class passenger that needed help, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and the bit in the lifeboat with her standing up for the women. I mean, that's all true, mm-hmm. but she didn't go by Molly and she wasn't, you know, Cameron still got her at the table, like telling the story about, you know, accidentally burning her husband JJ's money in the stove. Mm-hmm. And she's still got like the Western accent. And I don't know, the real Margaret Brown was, I mean, she deserves a movie all to her own and not sure. unthinkable Molly Brown because that's like <laughs> crap. <laughs> um, but the, I, mean, I did an episode on her, but the real Margaret Brown was, you know, a women's activist. Mm-hmm. She was studied um and really brilliant and even before she and her husband made a lot of money um in denver she you know was part of charitable organizations like even when she was kind of on the you know more lower middle class of Mm -hmm. excuse me of things Mm -hmm. um she was always involved in activism and she just was like a kind of a kick-ass like i don't know i mean she (laughs) She traveled the world. She helped a lot of people. She ran for political office. She's just like this um, amazing and and very refined. Like the Cameron movie still has her portrayed as very unrefined and she didn't belong with all of this old money and she Mm -hmm. was new money. But I mean, in real life, she was really good friends with JJ Astor. They had just hung out in Egypt together on that exact trip. She was not an outsider. She right. was very much an insider. So this mythological Molly we have in our minds of, you know, the the rough and tumble outsider that everybody would have scoffed at the minute <laughs> that she entered a room, uh, you know, and I don't know how much it matters, right? Like some of it is just cinematic choice and mm-hmm. casting Kathy Bates and having her do right. something fun. Um, so I don't know that there's a lot writing on it, but if I could redo the movie, that's probably the main thing that I would fix. Um, but I, you know, I think as far as the accuracy of the film, the third class gates that sticks out to me as an yeah. issue. I just did like, a, um, oh, turn this off. Sorry. Um, I just did a Patreon bonus episode on this. Uh, you know, the gates probably didn't look like they do in the Cameron movie. They probably were all like the lower gates and, The scenes he's got of the stewards holding, you know, third class passengers back and, you know, wielding guns and things like that, not a lot of proof for that. I mean, there is a huge debate about which gates were locked, what third class passengers were held back. There is a little bit of evidence that, you know, some of the stewards were holding people down because they didn't want to break immigration law on the ship and they were worried about the mixing of passengers and 
there definitely could have been a case where some third class people were held below, not denying that. But in terms of having ironclad proof that that sort of scene was going on, I don't think we really have that. So that to me is probably, I'm, I bet if he was going back and, and redoing the movie, he might film that a little bit differently is my guess. Um, but other than that, I mean, th from a technical standpoint, it's it, it holds up, I think, is as accurate as any Titanic movie ever has been. Um, sure. I think if someone were to write and shoot a Titanic film right now in 2022, it probably would look really similar. The sets would all look similar because down to the china on the tables, he had everything there, 100%. And I think the only other thing probably is, you know, the Murdoch suicide. And Cameron has admitted to this being problematic. So I bet that's something that if he could redo and reshoot, he probably would. Um, you know, there's no evidence that Murdoch killed himself. There's some speculative evidence that one of the crew members killed themselves. Some people think it might have been Officer Wild. But there's just, there's not enough evidence for any of these men having done that to to really put it on paper, in my opinion. I think you you end up doing more harm than good, mm -hmm. you know, to the families and things like that. So um, anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but it does. Those are those are three things that after watching it too many times, more times <laughs> than I'll ever, <laughs> more times than I'll ever admit to. Um, I think those are the things that stand out to me. But all that said, I think if someone is, you know, like if a 12 year old right now was just getting into all things Titanic, I would still say just, you know, first thing is go to that movie right. because not only will you just have this wonderful beautiful experience but you really will get the closest thing the closest match you can get i think to kind of being there you know in the accuracy and i'm you know people are a big fan of a night to remember and i think sometimes when i say that people think i'm knocking a night to remember but definitely not like they both have their merits in terms of accuracy as well i'm just i'm not as much of a scholar on a night to remember so i just can't sure. speak to it <laughs> um quite as much but that's fair i think for me what i would change is like um dan parks and i talked a bit about it was that whole cal murdoch bribery hullabaloo deal i mm -hmm. number one how unnecessary because murdoch was not denying men entry to the lifeboats and yeah. number two is just Again, it's like, you're on a sinking ship, man. I don't feel like now is the time to be thinking about your, like, financial strategies. It just, it seemed wrong to me, and I just, I don't know. I know you're supposed to hate Cal and all that, blah, blah, blah. It was like, this is just ridiculous. Yeah, it didn't seem, it, it seemed like the stakes didn't match. I mean, who in their right mind would care about money? I mean, Murdoch at that point in the night likely knew he wouldn't survive the night. He knew right. that, you know. Um so that, it doesn't make a ton of sense. I guess just in a script writing sense, it makes, you know, it works for Cal's character. You know, what's interesting, have you ever, have you ever watched all the, like the deleted scenes for Titanic? I haven't watched all of them, but I have heard enough people talk about them where it really feels as though I have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's how it, yeah, that's how it tends to be. <laughs> uh, there is one, Cameron actually shot this really intense chase scene Ugh. between Jack and Rose and Lovejoy. I, the this one I have out. seen. And um, it sort of speaks to your question of stakes, though, because they, you know, they spent like $3 million shooting this sequence. I mean, it's, it's really bad. And I will tell you, I love Leo with all of my heart. There's three people in my marriage, me, my husband, and Leo, and he knows that. And I, like, I mean, people think I'm kidding. I'm not. But. Um, no lies detected. That's that sign or that scene mm -hmm. leo's acting is just subpar it's terrible he like punches uh lovejoy in the face and he says something like compliments, compliments yep he goes uh, compliments, compliments of the of... chippewa yes. and he punctuates yes. the sentence with and that freaking punch it's, it's terrible his acting in that scene is oh, terrible he must have been he must have been really cold and phoning it in that day and i get it he but, was channeling uh, a pantomime actor from a british pants like christmas pantomime yeah, it was just, it's terrible, but they, they kept it in, in the original cut. And when they had, they had a screening at the mall of America <laughs> in, I think like, I think like 
I mean, don't quote me on this, but like May of that year or something or June, mm-hmm, like when mm-hmm. the movie was getting to be pretty complete, it may have right. been a little later, it been like September. Um, but he had the scene in and the number one comment that came back from viewers in the audience at the screening was, you do not need that scene because you, we are already on a sinking ship. So someone chasing them like that, you know, with a gun, it's like, putting caviar on top of caviar. I mean, why do you, like, you don't, you're already in the middle of a sinking where all the action is so beautifully done Mm -hmm. and we already have the stakes of life or death. So we don't need this additional, you know? So I always thought that was interesting that, you know, you can say a lot about James Cameron, but I think he does listen to feedback. You know, I've, I've heard he's, you know, quote unquote maniacal or whatever, but he's a really good editor and he, he does listen to feedback and he does edit his stuff down. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I think I think the movie really, really holds up. I'm excited for the re-release. I haven't seen it in a theater. I haven't seen it in the theater since uh, 98. Me neither. So, yeah. About that deleted scene, though, I go just it goes against so many characters motives. Like this whole movie, Spicer Lovejoy's had the attitude of a nanny who cannot wait to be finished with his last assignment. Like he Mm -hmm. is just over it the whole time. And he's the one who seems to get the stakes. Like the, um, they end up running down there because Cal pulls his, pulls Lovejoy's gun out and starts shooting at Jack and Rose, which I also think is kind of ridiculous. But he even tries yeah. to stop him. Lovejoy tries to like stop him. He tries to take the gun back, and he doesn't run down the stairs after him. You see him ambling along afterwards, like here mm-hmm. we go again. And it just seemed so such a one eighty that he would be so nonchalant, so over it, so done, a hundred thousand percent over it, out, quit, resignation handed in, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden he's like, "Just kidding, hand me that pistol." Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Wow. It, it has the mark of just like an action director, like thinking that he needed to write in an action set piece yep. to his action movie. But I, I think that the true brilliance of Titanic is that. I think this is why some people hate Cameron mm-hmm. because it's, it's jealousy because, you know, he was an, like an act, he's been an action writer director yes. who just, you could argue sort of accidentally made, I would think like the be- one of the best films of all time and one of the greatest love stories of all time. And mm-hmm. I think I say accident, not because anything he did wasn't um, purposeful and planned, but I think in the writing of the script, I do think it was sort of a, Hey, I want to make a Titanic movie. I know a love story will sort of sell it. Mm -hmm. Here's my idea. You know, I think like that part of it, it, he was just kind of throwing spaghetti. He's admitted it. He's admitted it. You know, I just, I wanted to get down to the rack. Mm -hmm. I wanted to film that footage. I wanted the funding for this movie. So (laughs) Romeo and Juliet on a boat, you know? And I think the, the simple genius of the script and what he put together, I think it makes people mad because, you know, people want, people want the, people want the cultural products that they, uh, you know, digest to be, you know, so meaningful and so esoteric. And, you know, what he did was just the simplest of things, but it works so beautifully and is executed so beautifully that you can't argue with it, you know, like, and I, I think it sort of triggers some people. Because we live in a culture now where it, it really is like, you know, my husband and I joke about it all the time. Like, if someone doesn't die of cancer in a movie, like, it can't be good or whatever, you know? <laughs> whatever like, it's the case everything, is. Yeah, like, it's everything. So much that we consume, save for maybe the Marvel movies, if you're considered an intellectual or an academic, then you're, quote unquote, supposed to be consuming, you know, really dark stuff, really complex things. And I... I don't know. I just don't. And maybe it's because I have kids, but I just don't ascribe to that. I think if something brings you joy, even if it's something simple, then that's really be a beautiful thing, you know? So I think it's important to acknowledge too, is that whether or not you think Titanic is a hundred percent, the best thing ever, you know, you can acknowledge that it makes some people happy. You can also acknowledge mm-hmm. that it was a lot of people's pathway into Titanic fandom because mm-hmm. I've asked the question on, on my show a few times where it's like, if you were a child in the 90s, how the heck else were you really supposed to come to Titanic? I mean, maybe a few people were lucky to have studied it in school and know about it mm-hmm. ahead of time, but 
Otherwise, if you were literally living under a rock, that might have been the only way you escaped Titanic mania. Otherwise, you at mm-hmm. least had some tangential knowledge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that's that's why I was saying it's, like, problematic to completely dismiss the movie. Because mm-hmm. I promise you, if the 97 movie hadn't happened, you wouldn't have titanic belfast and belfast you wouldn't have you know the titanic experience in cove you wouldn't have titanic pigeon forge you wouldn't have like all a a lot of these museums and attractions that we all love and want to get to and things like those all are a product of the popularity coming out of 97 Mm -hmm. you know because prior to that it was the discovery of the wreck in 85 huge obviously surge of titanic interest but other than that, I mean, it had been a long time since Walter Lord's A Night to Remember. And of yeah. course, you have, you know, Titanic Historical Society is working and things like that. So there is some stuff going on. But in terms of mainstream culture, it it was kind of gone again, you know, a- unless you were a Titanic person from way back who had read Walter Lord, who, who, who had gotten into sort of some of the science stuff in 85 with Ballard. Um, and so I, I do think that the 97 movie is... Uh, uh, really responsible for what we have now which is this awesome big titanic culture and then that becomes all of these museums and all of these public you know memorials and and you know constantly new books that are coming out mm-hmm. and you know descendants of some of the survivors or the victims that have a mouthpiece on instagram or whatever i mean this is why i think it's a huge part of why we have all of this it's important you know because it's awesome to have this huge titanic community so I think that's something also kind of important to acknowledge is simply the time in which Titanic came out because it was sort of the early era of home internet and cell phones and people having that connectivity that was slightly faster than what you were anticipating. Mm -hmm. You know, we were coming off, you get five rings and then the answering machine comes in. We were coming into things like call waiting. Oh, what a concept. Can you believe it? Yeah. Star 69. Do you remember Star 69? <laughs> yes, I do. I hate it, Star 69. Anybody, it, anybody who's like young, young is going to be like, think what I'm saying that? something dirty. I'm yes. Not, it's, not a dirty, it's not a dirty thing. It's not a sex I mean, thing. <laughs> know that the people at the phone company that picked 69 as the number were probably like oh absolutely you know i mean probably like giggling in the background when they picked that one but yeah no i mean you're absolutely right i started to interrupt but yeah it's yeah. just like that 97 is like a real turning point in mm-hmm. how we all communicated to each other yeah but, and it was on the tail end of sort of the end of an era which is getting very excited about big movie releases mm-hmm. because big movies simply didn't come out all the time like now it's unusual to have a quote-unquote scheduled box office slump there's always some banger coming out from some studio some marvel movie dc some Mm -hmm. some i don't know whatever but in you know in the 90s and the aughts movies just didn't come out that fast and they didn't Mm -hmm. get turned into home video as quickly so it was a much bigger deal to go Mm -hmm. see a movie and if there was no um, I don't know what website people use like to buy tickets online, but there was no that either. You'd have to show up. If you didn't get a ticket, you didn't get a ticket. You just didn't get in. I mean, I don't think I, I don't think like teenagers now would even understand no. that experience. You know, like you and, and not to condescend anybody because no, I mean you, it was just you can't time. control what yeah, you can't control what year you were born, so no anger, but um it it really was like, you know, I I miss that tactile experience of you know, yeah, we would go to the theater, you know, you could buy advanced tickets. So like you could maybe maybe pop over to the theater like early that day. And, and, but then even if you had a ticket, you still had to go wait in line to get a seat Mm -hmm. that you, like if you showed up right as the movie was starting, you would be on the front row and, you know, hurt your neck. So it was, it was, you know, no assigned seating. It was just the wild west. You would like save seats with coats and things like that. It was bonkers. Um, Yeah. And, and I think it was one of the early, it was really the crossover to on the threshold of like people communicating about their niche interests online. I mean, obviously like the internet had reached a point nascently in 97 where you have you know, you've got message boards you've got fan forms i mean i can't tell you how many websites i used to go to there was like kate winslet fan.com or mm-hmm. whatever like and you'd go to these sites and it would just be like 
pictures of them yes. and like filmography and like message boards. And it was so like innocent and fun. Um, and a lot of Titanic stuff bled over into that. I actually, I actually met one of my very good, good friends that I still have, you nice. know, when I was 13 and on those message boards and she and I still talk and communicate all the time. And, you know, Hey Shirley, if you're listening, uh, oh. but you know, yeah. So it, I think it was a really beautiful time. The internet scares me now. So I don't, you know, people keep asking me like, are you going to do YouTube? Are you going to do TikTok? Uh -uh. I'm like, no, yeah. I no, this is, I'm old now. I mean, not really, but this is my format. I like, I like that podcasts are sort of, you know, kind of like a new version of talk radio. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's my thing. And if I Same. never make a ton of, if I never make a ton of money off the podcast or whatever, I don't, that's not what I'm doing. I don't mm -hmm. care. I just, this is my format. The voice thing is what I do. I just, I, the internet freaks me out a little bit. So. I was talking to um, Raf Avila earlier who found, Oh yeah. Yeah. He's super viral on TikTok, And I mm -hmm. was telling him too, it was like, listen, man, I love you and your content, but I watch it on YouTube when you condense it all down into one 15 minute segment. I don't go to mm -hmm. your TikTok and watch it. And even he was like, no, I, I, I don't spend more time on TikTok than I need to as a creator. And it's just because even he acknowledges as a viral TikToker, he's like, it's a lot. It's addictive because the algorithm is literally created to addict you. Mm -hmm. It is. And it's scary. Mm -hmm. As a parent, it's scary. And I don't mean this to come off as a 90-year-old, no, no, no. but it is the, I've noticed that in my kids, like the, it's that gratification with absolutely everything everything is supposed to be in these you know super digestible quick bites or whatever so I think um I think that hopefully we'll I'm hoping there might be a shift where we shift back to like things tend to be kind of circular right. you know people <laughs> tend to like correct um I'm hoping there will be a recorrect and that we can I don't know. I mean, I miss like, I think that's why Reddit's great. Like I miss I the Reddit. old school, like message board days. And I think how long can we all sustain this notion that we really care about what people are like wearing on TikTok or like what dances like, like, oh, someone's 80 year old granny did a dance. Like why? That's not like at some point, I hope we want more out of our culture. Um, I very nostalgic for you know 80s 90s early 2000s culture because I think we were respected more by filmmakers I think we were respected more by content creators of whatever kind I just I think we're all kind of being um I think we're all sort of being disrespected and disrespecting ourselves you know and I mean I'm just I mean I'm on Instagram all the time so I'm certainly not innocent and everything and I you know obviously the podcast has an Instagram and I I depend on social media a fair bit to advertise the podcast mm -hmm. so Same. I don't want to seem like a hypocrite but um yeah I think the the 97 movie really represents the best of all of that and and that that wonderful era that window that we had kind of funny because they thought the Titanic was an end of an era in and of itself and it feels almost like the movie was representing but it did it really represented a bonkers mm -hmm. cultural shift and I think that I'm I'm a little younger than you I, th I think I did the math I think I'm five years younger than you but I'm still in that generation where it's like we went from analog and we took off and I remember yeah. that yeah no it's true and um, I think for, you know, for something like film, Titanic is the, it was the last great epic. And I get in a lot of trouble, I get in a lot of trouble with Marvel people. I mean, I've had a couple of listeners who are, who are Marvel people, like, message me specifics of like, here's my evidence why, you know, Marvel. Oh God. Like, I mean, I could, I could tell you some emails that I get that are. I'm inviting zero people to send me manifestos. <laughs> I do get manifestos, which I, I love. I love the good ones and I love the bad ones. Um, I've gotten manifestos before. People are like, oh, you said that Titanic was this monoculture moment that there is nothing like that anymore. And they'll send me like a manifesto about how Marvel is. A, and, I, and I'm just, I just, I don't connect with those films. And so sure. I don't, I'm not judging. I don't judge anybody. I sure. mean, my own kids, like my son saw the advertisement for Thor Love and Thunder the other day. He's like, mommy, I want to see that. I'm like, okay. I mean, I can't tell you, I'm not gonna tell you no, you know. Um, They're a good time. So, 
Yeah, they're fun. But I get in a lot of trouble with Marvel people because I, they really want to defend that as like sort of the the same kind of epic movie, the same kind of monocultural experience. But I don't, I think it's different now. I just don't think it's quite the same. Let so. me tell you why you're right. It's because every Marvel I movie... I like to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I think... Just follow me around all day and say that. I can do that. <laughs> but I, I think you have an... Oh, there's a really good reason for that. And I think it's because every single Marvel movie, and at least one a year comes out, is dialed up to 11. Every single one. And that's not to say they're bad. I like the Marvel movies. I just... I was behind. I just saw... entertainment. Yeah, I just saw the new... entertainment. Just saw the new Doctor Strange. Had a great time. Thought that was fun. Did not love what happened to Wanda. That's a different podcast. Um, <laughs> but... I like the Marvel movies, but when I try to think of what I consider iconic moments in classic films, like I'm, I'm thinking we're going to need a bigger boat. I'm thinking, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And as much as I don't love the line, I'm the king of the world. I actually hate that line, but that's a, another point. But you, you visualize it. And there is only one moment in Marvel cinema that I think might qualify and bring it to that level. And I think that is the Avengers Assemble moment in the oh, first yeah. Avengers I, film. I do think, and I did have one listener like mention that and I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, I feel, I feel that, you know, that's like an accumulation of so yes. much. And, um, but yeah, I agree. It's like, if you, if you, if I, as a person who consumes so much internet and culture, if there's not a line from your movie that I can recognize, it's probably not on that level. I a hundred percent agree. Yeah. yeah. And, and also just like the physicality of the movie making, uh, Cameron and, and other directors, you know, obviously have long done this too and did this in the nineties. So he's not unique, but mm -hmm. the movies aren't like props and sets aren't physically made the same way anymore. And the move to like all CGI, I mean, these Marvel movies have a budget of two, $300 million. And I, I don't know where that's going, I guess, to cast, <laughs> like, I guess it's going I to pay people. Um, I'm sure a lot of it is that absolutely intense CG budget because like not even those costumes are real. No, but it's going, it's all going to CG, but I, I don't think the CG looks great. I think like you need to build physical sets. I really mm -hmm. do. I mean, look at Chris, look at Christopher Nolan. He still does that, did that with Inception. Like even when um, they're like so floating cool. upside down in the room. That's a set. Watching that behind um, the scenes was bonkers. Just watching what looks like yeah. a grain silo that they have turned yeah. into a set. Not a grain silo, it's a incredible. cement mixer. It's like a cement mixer that oh, they yeah. opened yeah. up. Sorry. I've seen that footage. Yeah. yeah. And it's just rotating a box with people inside of it. You can't replicate. Like that's why Titanic ages so well, the movie, because he physically built those sets. I think, you know, when you are only relying on CGI, I don't, it is just my humble opinion sure. that it just doesn't, I don't know that 20 years from now, we're going to all be sitting around watching those Marvel movies, but I, everyone's still sitting around watching Titanic 25 years later. So I think that's a conversation to have. But then again, I don't, I, I don't think there's a lot of value in like knocking what other, you know, like I, we all love what we love yeah. and we all, you know, like if you're passionate about something, then I think that then you've won, you know? So yeah. I always respect whatever people are passionate about, but I obviously have a lot of uh, very market opinions about the movie. Um, anyway, it doesn't have to all, I mean, we can talk about the, the real ship too. It doesn't all have to be movie, I but care. I, uh, you know, I found that I, on my podcast, I tend to talk about the movie a lot, but also, I would say like 70% of the emails and questions I get from people are about the movie movie related. So yeah. I think, I think there's a lot of people that want to talk about it. Yes. Yeah. And that's why I don't mind. Like I, listen, I, I have historians on who talk about just the ship and I'm absolutely fine with that. But I, as someone who came to Titanic themselves from the movie, I, mm -hmm. it takes up a significant part of my affection. <clears throat> and, yeah. Yeah, and it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I wasn't I I had a very sort of like different upbringing. Is that I didn't realize that I wasn't quite on the same wave like as my peers until I was older. I was like, oh, so being not hypersexual is like a thing you can be. Got it. Because <laughs> yeah. I always thought Leo was cute, but it wasn't. I was like, why is everyone losing it? Like, I am not getting yeah. it. <laughs> okay, but I did. Even as a kid, my favorite officer was Murdoch. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Just I think it's because you see him with Smith 
in the Ode to Titanic scene, and they're both standing there with their hands on the railing, and got these big happy smiles, and I was just like, oh, so there's so two happy people, and I really like that. Yeah. So when there's a lot of <clears throat> oh no, go ahead. I was gonna say so when he when he ended up killing himself later on, it was equally upsetting to me because he'd been quote unquote my favorite, and now he was mm-hmm. gone, and I was like, that's not fair. I don't like that. Well, there's a, you know, there's a lot of, of evidence that Jim Cameron really did his research for like small, for, you know, for very small moments in the script, because, Mm -hmm. you know, that, for example, I mean, you know, Smith and Murdoch had worked together um, before at Smith had worked with most of the officer, you Mm know, and and, and, and there, yeah, he and he and officer wild were very dear friends. In fact, I'm pretty sure that captain Smith, wife, I would have to fact check this, but I think I'm remembering right. I think Captain Smith's wife actually set up like a fund for for Wild's kids after the oh. sinking because their mom had also died. Like oh. they had his wife had died a few years before. Um so I do believe that that Captain Smith's widow like set up a fund and helped his kids. So I think they were pretty close. It's very sad. Uh, but yeah, and, and, you know, so th- those little parts of the script are so accurate, you know, like, that's how it would have been, you would have had these, you know, these are great men of the sea, these are very decorated and appreciated men who've been on these ships for years and years working. I mean, it was hard, it was hard work, like really oh, hard yeah. work. And, uh, and they knew each other, they had a rapport. And it was this, you know, this feeling of, the white star line is entering this, you know, new era of luxury on the sea. And we have these seasoned officers and captain. We are at the top of our game. We have the the most storied, you know, wealthiest people on board. We've got, we're an immigrant ship. So we represent the promise of a new world to, you know, it was, it really was that feeling mm-hmm. and that scene where they're on the deck together and it's take her to see Mr. Mm-hmm. Murdoch. Like that's exactly what it would have been like. There was a sense of like celebration and joy and just human beings doing their job and being really excited about their job, you know? And, and so it is, those scenes are so heartbreaking because I think, you know, everybody got on that ship with a lot of just feeling a lot of hope and promise. Yeah. So, and I really liked that scene too because it was so casual for everyone. Like, someone brings Smith a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. He's ready to have tea. Watching his watching his ship glide through the Atlantic. He's like, Mm -hmm. "This is how I'm going to spend the next twenty minutes. I'm going to enjoy my tea and the view and my work." And just watch watch Mm -hmm. it like stretch its legs. Yep. And probably same with Murdoch because you know even though he'd been bumped down from chief officer, but you know I'm sure he was absolutely thrilled about and I bet he had a big party to celebrate that. Um, But (laughs) yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a lot, a lot of people write about that, Ooh, but yeah. I think they write about that with like not a ton of evidence, except just knowing that like he probably he probably be disgruntled. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's yeah. no proof, but I mean, I think anyone can relate to the concept of I thought I was yeah. going to be first, and now I'm second, and it's not because I did anything wrong. I'm just grouchy, victim of circumstance. Exactly, yeah. but even still, it's like he was a career mariner, a man of the sea who grew up with it mm-hmm. in his family, and again, same thing. It's like. I'm standing here looking at this gorgeous view and Cameron really does a great job in conveying that emotion to mm-hmm. the audience through both those two and their more like subtle ways, the officers, and then cutting back to Jack and Fabrizio who are outrightly celebrating. Like Jack is pointing at dolphins mm-hmm. like he's six years old at the zoo. Fabrizio mm-hmm. is making jokes like they they're having an outright party. And then you go back and see the much more subtle, like, we're, was like, we're on the clock. We can't, you know, whoop and scream, but yeah, we're happy. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, you see the whole ship, you know, the, all the layers. Yes. I do think that tracking shot over the top of the ship, may be one of the only shots that doesn't age well. It gets a little the, uncanny valley. <laughs> the, yeah. The, the, the CGI on that was just not developed quite well enough at right. that point. But yeah, but you see, you know, you sort of watch the whole ship. Um, as it's really heading out to open waters. And, you know, I, I mean, actually, funny thing about the dolphins. Um, I think this may, be, this may just be hearsay, but I have read 
that if it's Leo, what I think you're about to say, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I have heard that on set, Leo was a proponent of uh, showing the third class passengers like like shooting at the dolphins um, because apparently there was some sort of maybe evidence that that survivor remembered that happening or that like on ships at the time this is something they would do to like entertain themselves or whatever yeah. um so he was advocating for this and apparently james cameron was just like that that doesn't really fit the character that i'm building here of, i can of, see like it. innocent jack dawson <laughs> who's Seem in a walkie, like, I'm sorry, I'm trying to not establish the Silence of the Lambs. That is a different yeah, movie. It's a different movie. Like, we're, we we have just a couple of establishing shots for this man. We got the poker game. But we've, we've got to establish that he's really sweet. So I think killing innocent dolphins probably wouldn't... <laughs> with his friend at the front could you imagine like yeah like rose just falling in love oh gosh i'm falling in love with you i saw you shoot those dolphins instead of spitting over the side he teaches her how to shoot dolphins wouldn't wouldn't work so um but you know it it is uh the number one the number one uh you know criticism i still hear of the movie is how would anyone fall in love in two days i'm like have you met a teenager have you met? Yes. Number one, have you met a teenager? <laughs> no, number two, have you ever read? Do you like Jane Austen? Because Jane Austen does that. Have you ever seen a movie? Because every third movie ever made. Did is you watch basically the, yeah, any, any TV shows? Yeah. I mean, it's it, the premise of half of anything that's written or made is like two people fall in love quickly. And, and then what happens or whatever. So um, it just cracks me up when people throw that out. It's like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. My husband and I, my husband and I started dating after one date. So that is so fucking cute. I know we got we got engaged three months later. So you know what? I know it's like when people tell me that I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure by like the second date with my husband, I knew I was going to marry him. So don't think it's that different. I have a yeah. We just weren't on a sinking ship. So. <laughs> I have a, a teammate who, yeah, I think she met her husband, and then within six months he proposed, and they've been married, I don't know, has it been 15, 16 years? Yeah. Some, some astronomical amount of time. It does, and, and, and sometimes it happens the other way around, but I never yeah. found that... <laughs> I never found that unbelievable because I guess, again, I was eight when I saw it. So I was like, oh, that's just how love works. Because I was still, you know, thinking that Disney was how life worked. Um, but I wish it was. Right? Wouldn't that be so easy? It would be like, what was it, Enchanted? I was like, how long have you known each other? A day. Yeah. No, like, oh. I wish I was, yeah. And then birds singing everywhere. Yes. We, need, we, need, we need some of that in our we lives. We do. Right we don't have enough of that. Yeah. No. But, I mean, I always found it, it never didn't make sense to me. Because, again, like, I think everyone, okay, most people who are being honest with themselves can remember falling way too hard, way too fast at some point in your life for someone that was or wasn't mm-hmm. good for you. But the point is that you did. And it was like, what is it Eric says in Little Mermaid? He's just like, bam, hit me. Like, lightning. Mm-hmm. And it just does. Yeah. It just does. And that's, it's, it's not unrealistic. And to put, that's the brilliance of what he does to, like, put that on a stinking ship Mm -hmm. it's all the drama in the world it's like the most basic you know drama that as humans we crave if we crave a movie you know so it it really is genius and i think you know if you look at uh, if you look at stories of the passengers um there are it's like he he took little pieces from a lot of them you Mm -hmm. know like it's it's very obvious that he did his research there are little pieces of some of the first class passengers like in rows. There are mm-hmm. little pieces of some of the third class passengers in Jack or Tommy or Fabrizio. Um, and so he really, he uses that evidence to sort of craft, you know, yeah, they may seem a little stereotypical like, yeah. or whatever, but <laughs> it's not, you know, but there, there were a lot of like Italian men on that ship that would have been, they may not have talked exactly like Fabrizio, but that's what they would have been on that ship just right. headed to America. Just like, oh, my cousin lives there and I'm going to see if I can work with him. Or, oh, I just randomly met a friend that wants to travel together and we're going to make go of it in New York or whatever, or out West in California. What It's not, you know, that's not out of the realm of possibility. No. He did a really good job of, of, you know, representing different types of characters. I think if he made it in 2022, I think he'd spend a lot more time in third class as he should. Uh-huh. I think, 
you know, that's probably one of the only true criticisms of the movie is that third class is a little stereotypical and we need a, we need a, a more complex sense of, of life in all the classes. But, um, you know, again, 25 years ago, but right. I think for being 1997, I think you do get a fair amount of that, which most films didn't do at the time. Mm-hmm. So I think I didn't notice it when I was younger, but now that I've gotten older, I notice the stereotypical stuff more like, I feel as though Fabrizio's backstory was right before he arrived in that pub with Jack, he crawled out of a meatball. It's just yeah. <laughs> so stereotypical. Like I even, I'm really good with accents. Like I'm normally pretty good at like when people go, what was that? I'm the one that's able to go, oh, they said da 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 da. I had issues with his dialogue until 2020. I thought that when he was dancing with Helga, he was saying, are your parents pioneers? Okay. (laughs) That's not what they're saying. (laughs) That's not what he's saying at all. What is it? If he's saying like, can I put my hand here? Basically. I I didn't realize that until I turned on the subtitles because we had workers working outside and I couldn't hear the movie. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. That is a different line. Um, Um, (laughs) I, uh, I will tell you, the talking about lines in this movie i have had a fight with people about not a real fight but a a fake fight a funny fight with people because of the lewis abernathy line where he's like where he's like uh like uh anesthesia but he's like (sighs) talking about anastasia as the woman who like you know who the like the being like the fraud yes anna anderson was that woman's name right yeah yeah who claimed to be so he's like Mm -hmm. saying that the rose character is that and he says he like jokes and says anesthesia but he also could have literally just flubbed that up because i have heard worse slips in my life yeah he also could have just said anesthesia anyway um and the other funny thing is that uh, Lewis? I want to. I would love for Lewis Abernathy to come on my podcast. Uh, be a I want to talk to him. I love it when he is following Bill Paxton on the deck, and she, he's talking about like Rose's history because mm-hmm. he's looked her up, and he's like, and she moved to you know um, Cedar Rapids, right? And Pop had a couple of kids, <laughs> and the way that he says that. It cracks my husband up so much that if I'm watching the movie, like he can't, he won't even be in the room. He just but knows. he'll like run into the room for that line. <laughs> it is a pretty funny a line. Of, or she popped out a couple of kids. I think I know that line. Out a couple of kids, that I think it's yeah. something like then she moved to Cedar Rapids and punches out a but couple of kids. A couple of kids, yeah. Um, and it's so like, oh, that's yeah. like the most classic line in our household. Uh, <laughs> but. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I'm on your podcast, so I'll put it out there. I'm on this, like, um, sort of pseudo journey to try to get some of the secondary cast members from Titanic on yeah. my podcast. This is my goal. I know I can't get Leo. I know I can't get Kate. Never say I never. Think there, well, I think there's a world in which I could get Cameron <laughs> because I think he's, like, I think he's a, I think he's a Titaniac, right? Like, I think he's That's a lifelong a fair Titaniac. Point. That's a fair point. So, if he had the time I, and the ability... He might. But from what I've heard, he does not have the time. Uh, <laughs> I I had I had uh, someone named Stephen Schwankert on my podcast, who was one of the co-creators of uh, The Six, the documentary about the Chinese passengers. Um, can you hear me? It feels like it cut out. I can hear you. Okay. I, I was okay. typing, and my and my keyboard is like the loudest thing on the planet. So I didn't. Oh, <laughs> okay, I, I didn't want you to hear me. that. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> But no, so I, you know, I talked to Stephen Schwinkert, who uh, uh, was a co-creator on The Six, which is a documentary about the Chinese passengers on Titanic, and hopefully it'll be on um, streaming soon. But, you know, he, that movie is is executive produced by James Cameron. So they, you know, met with him and and his schedule apparently was so tight. Stephen was saying that they like, they had to get on a plane when they were given the clear you know, get to New Zealand. They had a certain window. I mean, the man is really that busy. So I think he probably catalogs his day in 10 second intervals. So (laughs) I, I doubt, you know, I I do think there's a world in which maybe, but anyway, all that to say, I'm not going to get Kate. I'm not going to get Leo save for a miracle. So I really have this dream of getting like the secondary cast members. And so I have like a I have a few listeners that have started this very grassroots social media campaign to get Billy Zane on the show. Um, so oh, Billy a Zane is un- an international treasure. He's amazing. Love him. And I heard him. I heard him on uh, on a Ferris's podcast recently on oh. um, what's it called? Unqualified. Uh, and <laughs> he's unqualified a great. 
Yeah. And he's a great, he's a great podcast guest. Like he knows what to do. So he's, he's good on mic. And anyway, so I have had some unsinkable listeners that will like troll in his comment section. <laughs> be oh, like, he should. you should contact unsinkable. I know. So Billy Zane, if you ever hear this, I will plug anything. I'll plug anything. I'll tell people, I'll tell people to buy your art. I'll plug any movie you're in. Um, so I don't know, maybe for the 25th anniversary that, you know, the listenership is, is, is up and yeah. you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe if I could, I think if I could like show my listen data to someone like him, he might think it's worth his while. But... I think he should come on your show. I would also love to talk to him. I, he seems just like a great flip in time, Billy Zane. Yeah, I just want to shoot the shit about, oh, yeah. look, I curse. Oh, I'm going to, you know, I've realized that I could do something is that in my intro is, is I'm um, a ship bell. I can, I can put that on top of it. Just, put the, just, <laughs> just yeah, be a ship guys, bell. Just, <laughs> um, just so everyone's informed about what we're talking about. I, we've had a conversation about cross publishing this episode because I, my podcast is listed as quote unquote clean. And mine um, is not. So, <laughs> so uh, so anyway, we may we may ding out the curse words, but yes. um, but yeah. So maybe one day, I I would love for the twenty fifth anniversary of the movie in December to get just like somebody that was on set in a fairly you know sizable role, just to like talk about what it was like yeah. to be in that moment in ninety six when they're filming in Rosarito, and just like what that what it felt like. You know, I would love to just talk to somebody and reminisce kind of about that for them. So we'll see. He has doesn't have social media that I can find, but I really want you and Anderson, who played Murdoch, to come on. <laughs> oh, gosh. Him. You know, I wonder if he – I bet he's reachable. I bet you could find some sort of email address for him, Someone right? Someone can help me. That would be wonderful. Because, again, <laughs> he was my favorite officer, and also I thought he was in the movie super cute. Still do. He is super so cute. So cute. I think there's a lot of fan fiction about Officer Murdoch. <laughs> <You should. laughs> I don't know why that that doesn't surprise me, but just hearing it confirm. Ah, oh, man. I don't know if that's a rabbit hole I'm going to dive down, but I think that's only because I have been in the fan fiction world before and I know what it can look like in there. Um, what have you, uh, in the Titanic fan fiction no. world or just fan fiction in general? No, okay. fan fiction in general. I used to like read and write a lot of anime fan fiction when I was in like college because I didn't have any friends. So I, I needed a hobby. Oh no, I, I mean, I didn't have any friends in college either. So <laughs> I'm not I, mad I, about I it. Totally, I, I, <laughs> that, no, I love it. I can't tell you how I, I didn't exa- do that exact nerdy activity, but I mean, that basically sounds very similar to me in college, yeah. 100%. I think we're like people like us are you know very well-rounded people because we've had that you know what I mean like I think like I don't know I think it sort of like carves us into more interesting people I agree when you when you spend some time alone and you are creative alone and not you go through a period where that really is fulfilling like that's a very it's a very good experience uh so you you have kids and they're the right age, but also I don't have children. So this is not a question for only people with children, but have you seen Turning Red? We have, we actually, uh, we watched it. Uh, we were on a trip back in March and uh-huh. just like randomly at our Airbnb and per- turned it on. And I didn't know if the kids would like it, but they really liked it. So yeah. good. And I know that a bunch of, well, there's a bunch of criticism on it because a bunch of people were like, oh my God, periods. But a bunch of other people were like, oh my God, girls, fan fiction, they wouldn't do that. And it's like, I think that one of the really important things that people need to acknowledge, especially with kids growing up on the internet, is that kids get into weirder stuff than you think they do earlier than you think they do. And they're not mm-hmm. all that upset by it. Cause you know, mm-hmm. you know, it's not like a 13 year old is going to stumble upon something like, you know, May's fan fiction or her little drawings and be like, <gasps> or I mean, they might, if they've never been exposed, but for, for many, yeah. for many kids, that would be very normal or writing in their journal about having a crush. You want, you want to kiss somebody. It's, absolutely. Yeah. It's so normal. Yeah. And One, and I think that lends back in, I didn't bring that up for no reason, I promise. It lends back into the Titanic thing of just tapping into those young feelings. Like, I watched Turning Red and I was like, oh my god, I was the, I was the kid that was the weird, I was like the bananas anime kid that played an instrument, you know, my dad is Indian. It's like, I'm like, oh god, that's kind of my life. So I knew, I knew what it was like to be that person. So it was easy for me to feel that way about Turning Red, be like, oh god. What if my mom had found my diary? 
-hmm. But I think it's easier, especially now that I'm older, to watch Titanic back and be like, it's so easy to fall in love when you're young and when someone, this is going to sound like a a bare bottom, but I don't mean it to be that, but when someone is kind to you. But I don't just mean kind Mm -hmm. like here, have a candy bar. The kind of real kind that that Jack is to Rose that oh yeah I'm not seeking a reward from you I mean the reward is obviously he thinks she's cute and he'd like to date her but especially when they first meet and he saves her it's like the reward is that you didn't die the reward isn't hey maybe I can get your number or something I think it's I mean I think absolutely and I think Jack Dawson ruined a a whole generation of women (laughs) because I think we I I say that jokingly I, I think a lot of us you know, in, in my generation, like Jack Dawson became like who we wanted to find, right? Like this idea that someone could be completely innocent and earnest, but also kind of worldly, like mature enough to be worldly and traveling, but also like sweet and innocent enough to be the most gentlemanly man you'd Mm -hmm. ever meet. And also an artist and passionate, but also going to be a gentleman and wait for your cues and not, you know, like, like Rose really initiates a lot of the physicality, Mm -hmm. like he kind of waits for her and, and she, you know, like the scene in the car, like, he takes on in some ways the more feminine role Mm -hmm. you know and and Cameron is a lot of great like kind of I think complex stuff with the gender dynamics there which was weird for 97 but yeah I mean I think Jack Dawson ruined us all because he's like the (laughs) he's like the perfect guy you know and and that's that's why I think you just yeah I mean of course she would fall in love with him of course we fell in love with him but I I do think that Titanic taps into they a very innocent childlike wonder Mm -hmm. uh, especially for females and i think that's one of the reasons why it's hated on so much yeah by certain communities because any anything that females get a uh unabashed you know forever sort of love feeling about we we get crapped on you know like that thing gets crapped on and 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 the the things that that do that to boys don't you know yeah. like the nerd culture things that boys fall mm-hmm. in love with Star Wars Star Trek, um, you know Marvel like it, it doesn't it, it doesn't get treated that way but no. if it's something that brings teenage girls joy then it's insult it just drives me crazy like and yep. and it, I mean we're half the population mm-hmm. and we what we love matters like and yep. and. And I just, I'm so angry when it doesn't seem that we're, you know, are the, the things we love are treated that way. It just is one of my big triggers in life for sure. I think that you're absolutely right. And I'm remembering being in middle school and loving Sailor Moon. The same intensity oh, yeah. that the boys in my class liked with the show at the time, which was Dragon Ball Z. That was the big show. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't oh, yeah. a problem for them. It was only a problem for me. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, I was, 100%. yeah, and it's this exact same thing. And I remember reading a book by, oh, what's her last name? Uh, Peggy Orenstein. It's called Cinderella Ate My Daughter. It's a really good I've book. I've heard of this book. Yeah, I've Excellent. heard of this book. A hundred thousand yeah. percent recommend. Now, it's a little out of date now just because I think it's probably, what, 15 years old or something, but it still holds a lot of points. But basically she goes through looking at like, what are the origins of girly girl culture and how do they affect our, our girls? Because she's talking exclusively about, like, girls under 18. I'm not trying to be yeah. diminutive and pejorative here. but and, Yeah, but girls, yeah. Yeah, literal girls. And a lot of what she found was just that from such a young age, we're just stomped on for liking things. Like, I take riding lessons as an adult, and the joke I get from people sometimes is, oh, are you a horse girl? It's like, no, I'm a person who rides a horse a woman. sometimes yeah or or like even if you did want to identify as a horse girl what's wrong with that yeah, what's, you know? what's disgusting like, about that it wouldn't be like the only defining part of you it wouldn't be it would just be like oh here's one part of me is i mean like i call myself titanic girl now yeah. because i mean and i'm 37 i'm not even a girl quote 33 unquote, like, i say i'm a girl I, yeah, but- yeah, but I just, uh, you know, I embrace that. I mean, mm-hmm. some people sort of like say that and I think they're kind of, they're kind of like, oh, I'm sorry, you're known as that now. And I'm like, I, no, I, that's exactly what I want to be known as because it really represents who I am. Yeah. And um, I know there's yeah, some I people like, that don't like girl. I know that, I know that, I, and I do want to acknowledge well, that. Well, yeah, some people, yeah. There are a lot some of people, people who, don't. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people who hate it. I personally, I think maybe it's because I never feel like a real adult. I don't mind being called a girl because I'm like, yeah, I know nothing. I am not entitled to my maturity at all. <laughs> 
I don't. I with every passing day, especially in not to get political, mm. but we're get in the political. U.S. of A. So with every passing day, I understand less and uh, and 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 sort of have um, l- less and less uh, faith in humanity, unfortunately. So um, you know, <laughs> but, I think, but like first of all, not I, I'm not going to cut away from that because I think it's important. I do also want to acknowledge that because. We are in a time right now. It is July the 6th of 2022, where we as American citizens can wake up every day to basically a new educational decree from our Supreme Court telling us what we can yeah. and can't do anymore. That is a reality now. And if you are one of the like one listeners that I have that is not in this country, I would just like you to understand that that is the reality for American citizens right now. Mm-hmm. And a hundred percent. And yeah. we have no input. There is, there is no vote. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I don't love giving JK Rowling any more attention, but using umbrage in the educational degrees is unfortunately a great example. There was no warning. There was no approval process. You simply wake up to a rule. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I think, you know, I mean, I can tie it back to Titanic Please. in five seconds. And I, I think I, so I get a lot of, and I'm, like I said, going to release this on my feed too. So, you know, listeners, y'all are, y'all been through the journey with me, but I've, <laughs> I've, I've had several people troll me in my reviews uh, for quote unquote, getting political, though I would Ugh. argue like, you obviously haven't been listening the whole time because I've been political since episode one. Or but, you just don't you know, understand how the world works right now. Or you now. just don't understand which pro- this probably is what these people <laughs> situations well. are in. But yeah. Um, but I, and I feel like I can say that about them if they've, I mean, if you've, if you've taken the time to leave hateful remarks on somebody's podcast about, you know, like then Anything. I think they're fair game. Um, but the, I, I take a lot of, yeah, I, I, I get a lot of kind of hits from these trolls that are mad that I make Titanic about the environmental crisis. I have had an episode about James Cameron where I, I mean, James Cameron has been really vocal about using the iceberg and Titanic as a modern day analogy for climate change. Yeah. And I have talked a lot about that. I have talked a lot about, um, you know, equal rights and immigrants rights and things like that in terms of Titanic. And I always tie it back. And I literally have had people in my reviews say, this podcast was so good until she got political and tried to look at 1912 through 2022 lenses. That's um, what, that's what y- wake, you're supposed wake to do. Up. Yeah, like wake up people, like we have to, that is what history, what is the point of history unless it is to, um, you know, analyze our lives, look at what we're doing. Um, you know, try to understand the fabric of our society through history as well. Mm-hmm. I would argue there's no value in just writing down a history that is dates and names and putting it in a bookshelf. That, And I'm a historian with mm-hmm. an academic degree. Yeah. That's pointless. Um, and so to tie it back to Titanic, because that's what I do and I will always do. And if Please anyone is still... If anyone is still listening to my podcast and not liking the political, I don't know what you're doing. You're just get self-flagellating the... at this point. Yes. Like, you know. It's like um, uh, Karen Kilgariff and Georgia Hardstark say at the uh, beginning of their live shows, if you don't like that, then you can get the fuck out. Yeah. Ding that. But I yeah. will, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I mean, I, I'll tell you that, like, it's hilarious. I wish if I change the rating on my pod, I'll play it for people. But, you know, my six year old recently discovered yelling that word is hilarious. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's the funniest thing you'll ever hear. Kids um, being but, kids using adult vocabulary is what children so were put funny. on this planet for. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, but to t- but yeah, I mean, you can tie it back to Titanic immediately, right? Like mm-hmm. you've got this moment in 1912 where this myth is that nothing, this myth is that like, the myth is that, you know, politically, economically, socially, you're in this like, you know, amazing high flying period, technological the golden growth, era. The golden era, and that Titanic wakes the country up, wakes the world up, and that's the, the the death of an era. That is so not true. And and I'm not the only one to say that. A lot of historians have already made that point. But you know, the women's rights movement was boiling and boiling and boiling. Mm-hmm. I mean, on the on the day of JJ Astor's funeral. In 1912 in New York, you have the largest women's suffrage parade that has ever happened. So those two things are going on concurrently. Yeah. And Astor, yeah, it does kind of represent, I think, the, you know, his literal death, I guess, did kind of 
you know, metaphorically represent the death of just that, that coming off an era of like unchecked wealth. And, and here is where we are again. 110 years later, you have this problem with unchecked accumulation of wealth yeah. and a hierarchy of white males yeah. that have legislated female bodies that have, you know, that still want to have sort of, you know, dominion over, uh -huh. um, you know, society, culture. And then you have, you know, what is hopefully a women's rights movement boiling again. I mean, history is so cyclical. Yeah. It's never, it's never a straight line. It's not just progress. It's up, it's down. But I mean, there you go. You can draw exactly back to 1912. Yeah. That Astor funeral happening, you know, concurrently with that women's suffrage parade, there's no better way to just like, I mean, of course it's relevant. That's exactly the moment that we're in right now. I mean, people worshiped Astor yeah. for his money. Yeah. I mean, and, and Astor did a lot of good things, but he also... I mean, his family were, they were like the slum lords of New York City, Listen, you know? No and family you with wealth got their wealth by being altruistic the whole no. time. No, and, and, and I mean, like right now I'm reading a lot about uh, the Vanderbilts because I'm, I'm going to do a special episode uh, on Biltmore and, and George Vanderbilt. He's sort of part of the like just mystic club because he was, you know, almost on Titanic. But oh, yeah. I'm reading a lot of, I'm reading a lot about the Vanderbilts right now as kind of a side project. And. I mean, same thing. I mean, it's a fascinating history. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, oh, yeah. I eat it up like candy, and it's so fascinating. But, you know, that's not pretty. Like, the no. journey to that kind of wealth is not no. pretty. Um, and people need to understand that. Exactly. You know? And yeah. I think it's the same thing that I have to bring a more modern example. I don't know if you saw the Hulu mini, um, the limited series, Dope Sick. No, I know a lot of people that, that watched it and told me I need to watch it. I just haven't had the courage to go into that darkness yet, it but will, I know it's really good. It will rip your heart out in a way that yeah. you did not realize you could feel sadness for people. Yeah. Because it, in the same way that, you know, I think Cameron did with Titanic by bringing something old to the light, that show did something similar by bringing something very hidden forward. And it told a very unpretty story about how a family gained its wealth. When you look into yeah, how people gained... That's exactly... Yeah, that's a great example. Mm -hmm. You look into and, how and these it, fortunes were built, it's never like, oh, they made cookies for everyone in town and the townsfolk were so grateful that they gave them $5 yeah. every day. Like, that's never the story. That's not how wealth is... A key. No. And, <laughs> and, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm not an economic historian, so I always hesitate to go, like, too deep into the history. Like, I don't tackle, like, the history of capitalism, really. In <laughs> I don't... I, I, I I just don't, you know, like, I would open up cans of worms that I'm not fully, you know, able to deal with, probably. <laughs> nope. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think, you know, it's, it, there's a direct through line. That's why Titanic, you know, is stays as relevant as it does. There's a direct through line. And it's, you know, you can look at someone like Margaret Brown. And, you know, I'm going to do I did one episode on her, but it was more mm -hmm. an interview. And I, I want to do an episode on her in the fall that is more just kind of her activism. But I mean, she was she was in that moment in 1912 saying, like, no, we don't you know what I'm going to I'm going to work within the system. Mm -hmm. I'm rich now. So I'm going to like, you know, hobnob with these people like Astor. Mm -hmm. But really, what I'm getting done is I'm going to take their money. I mean, she was on Carpathia. Um, asking the first class survivors for money for the third class. Mm -hmm. And anybody who didn't give money, she put their name on a board. <laughs> and, it said, and it said, and it said, like, this person didn't donate. So, you know, Ooh. I mean, we need more people like that. Yes. That's working what within you need. the system. Yeah. So, anyway, that was a tangent. But, um, and I was know it? you said we should probably wrap up. I don't want to no, I mean, like we can 18 talk longer. hours to edit, but as long as it's um, under like 90 minutes, I don't really care. It's just like my, my first two interviews were three and two hours and it was just like, Oh my God. Oh yeah. I, um, and I, I, and I, yeah, I've got about 15, I've probably got like, I've got 10 or 15 more minutes before the kid noise may overwhelm the recording, but yeah, I, mean, I, have to take, um, I have to deal with this dog in about 10 before he absolutely loses his yeah, mind. So let's look, <laughs> let's look for 10, but yeah. just, but side note, I did that too. I mean, the first couple of interviews that I did mm -hmm. ran more to that two hour mark and it was fun, but I just, yeah. the editing process is too cumbersome. It takes forever. It takes so long. 
And so I just, yeah, I try to, I always shoot for an hour and it usually ends up being about an hour and 20. Yep. And then that's pretty easy to edit down. Same. But um, anyway, so yeah, let's go. So why don't you just, I don't know if there's anything else you want to cut about if you want to ask like one more big question or, well, you know, I don't, we could probably... I don't have a really big one, but I guess my question for you would be like, so you're doing the podcast and all that. What would like this time next year? I hate when people ask me these questions because I never have any <laughs> freaking clue, but I'm going to do it to you because this is my show. Where do, where do you see yourself in the podcast in about one year's time? Um, I, I've sort of, <laughs> I hate this question now. Uh, <laughs> you I've been, skip. Uh, yeah, no, I've been, you know, I, I've been sort of going with the flow. Um, I never imagined it would even go this long, but I started it in September. I was like, you know, if I do six episodes and a hundred people listen, I'll maybe do a few more, you know, like I didn't, right. I didn't see it even, you know, so I'm just really thankful that I, you know, season one was really, you know, from a lot of standpoints, just successful. Like I've met so many people, um, listeners from all over the world. Like I'm just grateful more than anything. I think my goal for season two, and this is a great maybe entree into that. I think one of my big goals for season two is to have some more conversational episodes. Mm -hmm. Um, my interviews tend to be on the more formal side, which sometimes that's a good thing. Like, I I mean, I had a heart, I mean, I had, you know, uh, the head of the humanity center at Harvard on. So like I was nervous and uh, Stephen Beale, I, I was nervous and he, I'm still reading, his you book. know, yeah, it's like, I, I mean, I was, I mean, that's, that's a big, big wig. So, yeah. you know, those are more formal, but I, you know, like for example, I'm going to have a friend of mine on whose mom is, was from Ireland. She's visited Ireland on and off her whole life. I'm going to bring her on. We're just going to talk about Harlem and Wolf and Ireland and Belfast and just kind of have a, you know, so awesome. I'm going to do a little bit more conversational episodes here and there. I also, this is kind of letting a cat out of a bag, but mm. I also am starting a sort of side side series podcast about just other mythic places in America and uh-huh. sort of um, sort of places that we kind of literally and figuratively view as haunted by memory. Um, so I am starting another pod in the winter it's gonna it, a lot of this is it takes time as you know yeah. <laughs> to put episodes together it does. um so i think a year from now i think i'll just be grateful if you know if the unsinkable is still something people enjoy listening to i love making it so i just i have a great audience from all over the world so i just want to continue to make quality episodes and i am really thankful for you know my patreon members i i I guess in a perfect world, I probably would like to move towards featuring ads a little bit here and there because it, sure. you know, it, making the pod is a lot of work and yes. it's, you know, the listenership is growing. And so um, I definitely will give the listeners a fair warning about my process when I do that. But I, mm-hmm. I mean, I do hope um, I am one of those people that is really honest about like, yes, I mean, this is kind of my job now. So it is, <laughs> it is a form of income and it's a lot of work and requires a lot of, um, it requires a lot of resources yeah. with, te- with the technology and then the hosting fees and things like that. So yeah, I think a year from now, I'm just going to be grateful if the pod is still going strong and maybe the second pod I started, if a few people follow me over to that and, and kind of have some broader discussions about like history and some other places. Cause I just am really interested in, um, I'm really interested in why we are obsessed with places and, and events, you know, like something like Roanoke, some like the lost uh-huh. colony, something like, you know, Titanic is one of them, something like Biltmore, something like, um, you know, I just went to the Whaley house in San Diego, the Ooh. most ha- quote unquote, the most haunted house in America. Uh-huh. And there's a very storied history about the family that lived there. So I, I want to explore like why we are obsessed with certain places and why we put so much energy into places being haunted or being mythic right. and and like what does it mean to us like why do we define ourselves through these very specific um i'm going to focus on america just because i these are places i've been sure. and, and traveled and i i don't have a degree in in you know global history that's another i mean anytime i do an episode that branches a little bit into world history i, I you know i'm not in my familiar territory so i get it um so yeah, so that's yeah. I mean, that's probably more than you wanted to know, but no. that's the goal. I'm kind of. Spe- I know I'm gonna like cross publish this too, so I'm kind of speaking to my listeners as well. Like, yeah, yeah I just. I also didn't know that, it. so it's, it's not like you're <laughs> telling me twice. 
<laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I love it. I, I really like podcasting. We were talking before we recorded mm. about uh, podcasting kind of being, you know, talk radio, yeah. of the modern era. And I've, you know, some listeners told me they clean their house while they listen to me. And oh, that's fantastic, that's you know, great. and like, it's just fun to be in people's ears. And um, I want to do a lot more interactive stuff. Um, I do, I can't say any details yet because it's still in the works, but I do have an appearance coming up in the fall, which is exciting. And I really want to do like a couple of live shows. So Ooh, if I'm in the area, yeah. I'll come. Oh yeah. I, I mean, I, I'll, I can't say any specifics because it's like things are so in the early planning mm -hmm, stages. Mm -hmm. I don't want to disappoint. I, not that anybody would be disappointed. You know, that, that doesn't sound right, but I just don't want to speculate until things are saying. a little more certain, but, um, but yeah, just like staying in the milieu, hearing people's feedback, being part of the Titanic conversation. There's so many cool books coming out. Yes. There's so many good pod. I mean, obviously you just entered the podcast realm. There's like <laughs> several good podcasts. Um, there is, you know, there's a lot, there's room for everything. And there's, um, you know, there's always like, like the Titanic 666 moment, you know, like there's always some like random culture thing that's popping up for us all <laughs> to discuss. Um, and, uh, I do for people that may be on the fence <laughs> about Patreon, I do have a bonus episode on there. My husband and I are yeah. very, very on a sub like, Okay. That sounds bad. I was going to say on a substance. I just had some wine. That didn't sound good. Um, but <laughs> The substance being wine, wine doesn't it does clarify things. Just, just the substance being wine. Um, I just thought it would be a pithy way to say it, and then I was like, that doesn't sound good. Um, <laughs> so, but anyway, so that's there, and I think we're about to do a uh, we're going to do a film swap episode one on Patreon soon too. But, um, but anyway, all that said, I'm just excited. Thank you for having me on. Like it's Thank it's fun to be in conversation with other Titanic podcasts, um, other podcasts in general. I mean, that's you know, I kind of want to be in the podcast milieu too like I definitely mm -hmm. look um in the future I'd love to go to one of the podcast conventions and just like meet and Wouldn't talk with fun? other podcasters too yeah I know we we should all all the Titanic you know pod people should go we to should. that I we mean it would make be a... fun to have like a little um you know environment okay. there within that we should um, totally though we should all so. get get together and get like one of the bigger tents or something that'd be fun make a little Titanic yeah, we section should. I just think there's, you know, this is where every podcasts are where everything's going. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, so many people get their history, their information, their pop culture kind of like discussion from podcasts. So I think it's just really exciting. So, I mean, the most important thing is just thanks for having me because it's just fun to talk. And I mean, I, people ask me all the time, like, you know, does this feel like work or like what? And I mean, it is kind of my job now but it doesn't feel like work I just love it I, I I'm lucky because I get to do something that is a total like nerd out happy place you know like yeah. I'm incredibly lucky and incredibly grateful just to get to nerd out so well, I am glad you're doing it I I cannot say that I started listening in September I think it was more like November of last how year how dare you I know how dare you? I know I'm you gonna tell, go you tell me now at the end I'm gonna go dangle <laughs> off the back of a ship now in shame Please <laughs> I, I do not have that courage I do not think I'd be able to turn back around and successfully get back over it's like I, no, I very I one way died. Yeah, I'd no. Be, I'm, Jack Dawson wouldn't have been able to hold. I would have needed him me either because I'm like squirt. I'm like a squirmy, like very. I'm a very clumsy person, so he wouldn't have caught me. I've been dead, 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 dead. So. I just, I, I would just be like, no, I'm gonna stay here for the rest of my life. Like, turn around, like, no, 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 no. We're good. No, I'm good. We're, we're good. Just yeah, here. Just, just ride it all the way to New York. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, let me know over at the harbor. <laughs> I am. I am so so excited to have you on. I. I took a, my own little break from Titanic Mania just because, and yours was the first podcast I started listening to when I started coming back in. And when you were recommending all those books, I just bought all of them. <laughs> so they were oh, that's so on good. My shelf yeah. <laughs> and getting through them slowly. But there are so many books. There yeah. are. But I, I'm really excited to have you because, like I said, you're the first sort of thing I started following once I came back into Titanic. And it's been. 
you've been in my ear since then. And when you said you'd come on my show, it was an amazing moment. So thank you so much for coming on. Oh and my gosh. Steal your time. And- of course. I, I love the communication we've had and I, you know, like just backstory for listeners. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, you, you know, you kind of just emailed me to talk <laughs> about the pod and we just kind of got to know each other that way. And mm-hmm. I'm so glad it came to fruition. Me I remember too. when you emailed me and you were like, well, about maybe yeah. starting a pod and I was like yes and you um, did you so did I'm, just, I'm so glad that it came to fruition Me and too. it's an honor to be you know in the first crop of guests and um I think there's gonna be a lot of cross-pollination I mean you've already like you had Veronica Hinky on she's been on my so podcast nice. like yeah I think it's I, I think probably we're gonna end up talking to a lot of the same people I, I almost hope but, so because there's some people yeah, I've talked but, to that I would love you to talk to like I think you and Dan well, and Parks and versa. Jan- Jared um, Honda especially would because ha- they're also historians like you so I was like I want to get yeah, you three I'm in a room get, <laughs> I mean we should do some maybe we could record some sort of like round table you know like yeah. there's there's a lot of good options here and so it's just wonderful to have the conversation going and to have females in the conversation. It's yes. really important that we're females in the space. Yes. Um, Women for Titanic. Let's do it. Absolutely. But yeah, thank you. No, thank you for having me on. And I'm excited to publish this for my listeners too. Um, your interviews are very, you know, they're very conversational, but I yeah. mean that in a good way. They're, you know, I think it is a good juxtaposition against some of mine. Mine are a bit more formal. This is a different style, but I think that's a good th- I, I think that's good. That was such a really a fun interview. LA was so sweet. I was so excited to talk to her. I was definitely having my own little fangirl moments. And if you want to have a fangirl moment for her, uh, you can go out and check out Unsinkable, the Titanic podcast. That is um, Unsinkable Pod, all one word, on Twitter and on Instagram. And if you look up Unsinkable on your podcast platform of preference, you will be able to find her podcast easily. Uh, thank you to everyone. If you want to get in touch with me, please do. You can send me an email at titanictalkline at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. The username is Titanic Talkline. Let me know what you think about the show, about Titanic. I don't know. Let me know anything. It's... Do you want to have a regular conversation? Go for it. Uh, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.